I never thought this day would come. <sighs> I never thought I would have an answer. I never thought I would be fully healthy. I thought I'd probably die at some point, which sounds really dramatic, but my body keeps shutting down and keeps getting worse. So I think, okay, like, this, whatever this is, it will kill me eventually. Um, it's more the emotion of, I can't believe I did this to myself, and just, you know, regret. And I don't like living with regret. So would I advise someone to do this? No, no, find, find confidence somewhere else, find happiness somewhere else. Don't feel pressured. For me, I think I did feel pressure to be a certain way, to be accepted or be loved, and that's not real. And if you're younger, that may seem very real. I promise you, it's not. The debilitating part of this has been about five years. So uh, when I was 25 years old to now I'm 30, um, that's... <laughs> Um, it's a really tough pill to swallow. I remember going to visit my nephews up with my sister and thinking I can't even... <sighs> I can't keep up with them. I can't pick them up. I can't have a family. Um, you know, and you think like... <sighs> What could I have done? What would I have done if I wasn't spending five years of my life in um, doctor's offices and researching? And I thought <laughs> I was told and I thought so many things were wrong with me. 60,000 women following this who explant daily, daily. And for them, it saved their life. And I remember seeing a post. Um, Someone said, hey, does anyone regret explanting? And I looked at it because I was curious, does anyone regret it? There had to be 600, 700 comments on there last I ever looked. Not a single person regrets it. Every single person. I feel better. It saved my life. I'm the girl with problems. And it's hard because I, I can't just live my life. I'm not crazy. <sighs> okay, so today we are talking about something different than makeup and style and everything else you see on my channel. So um, today is going to be more of a serious kind of tone video. Um, so from the title, you can obviously tell, um, what it's going to be about. So it's about breast implant illness. Um, I think by now certain people have heard, um, what it is, uh, from other YouTubers and, you know, people talking about it recently. Um, for me, I discovered what it was about three months ago. Um, and I felt kind of like an obligation to make this video um, as it is really personal and, you know, puts me in a very vulnerable position. Um, I just think there's not enough awareness out there. Um, you're not going to hear about this from doctors or experts or anyone in that field. Um, so I think this is one of those things that is going to be kind of brought out by word of mouth um, by people that have actually gone through it. So um, I guess I'll just start at the beginning and I'll apologize in advance. Um, if it's kind of all over the place, I'll do my best. Um, I'm basically going to share um, the quick version of what the last eight years of my life have been like. Um, uh, to now and you know what I'm doing at this point. Okay, so um, 2009 I got my first set of implants. Um, I 
uh, let's see, those were a saline under the muscle. They were 425 cc's. Um, I was 19 years old, about to be 20. Um, you know, I guess I'll kind of throw in why did I get them at this point. I don't want the entire video to be about why because um, that's really not something I feel I need to answer or I owe anyone that explanation. Um, people get plastic surgery for all kinds of reasons, whether um, they're a cancer survivor, a mom, um, or someone just that maybe struggles with their self-image or they just want to feel more confident or it's an area of their body they're not okay with. Um, there are a lot of reasons. I don't judge anyone for doing it. I know a lot of people have their own opinions about it. So for me, I was 19. Um, I grew up dancing. I wanted a future in dance. Um, at the time, like 2000s kind of era, um, that was the look. Like, you know, the um, kind of like, you know, everyone had the fake boobs and they were on uh, MTV and whatever and that was just kind of like the sought after look at the time. Um, so for me it was like a mixture of I thought I needed that to fit a certain you know kind of mold for that industry. Um, and I also would say you know growing up I struggled with self-image. Um, you know I was bullied as a kid and as I kind of grew up and grew into my body and myself, you know, the bullying sucked. So I guess for me it was more self-image, confidence, and what I would gain from it. Um, so that could be a whole nother video within itself. I don't want to get too much into that, but that was my reasoning at the time. Um, so I went to see, to see the doctor. I was um, 19, like I said, it was July 2009. Um, it was pretty quick. Like most plastic surgery appointments, you're in, you're out. They're very quick about it. You don't hear about risks, really. The only risk I was told about was you may have an immediate reaction where they would know your body is rejecting the implant and they would take it out. That was the only thing I was ever told about as far as risk. Um, so, signed off, got them. I didn't really notice anything for about six months. Um, so, at the time, I left Michigan, where I'm from, where I had the surgery, and I moved to Portland, Oregon. Um, didn't really notice anything. And then... I would say at that time I maybe started feeling more like fatigued and tired. Um, in my time there I went to an audition in Seattle to be a performer and a dancer at Disney World which is the reason I ended up here in Orlando, Florida. Um, so I went to the audition, I knew I got the job, I moved down to Florida within about six weeks. Um, and you know, I'm dancing, I'm doing shows, you know, that's part of it. And then every morning you go to work and your feedback is, you know, listed on the wall. So it could be anything like, you know, great energy, great job last night, just your feedback from your choreographers and performance coaches. My feedback started being kind of like you're late on turns, you're behind account. And again, like I was a dancer my entire life. This is Disney choreography, so it's nothing extreme. And it was basically telling me I wasn't keeping up. Um, and I remember calling my mom and we were both just like, what, that's so weird. And at the time, um, I really thought, okay, you know, I'm young, I'm going out, you know, I'm maybe not sleeping as much. You know that's kind of what I decided it had to be so you know moving on with my life um, I ended up leaving my contract at Disney and that that was not health reasons that was personal I just wanted a different type of life for myself and I wanted you know a career and something I could grow in so I did decide to leave and go back to school um, 
So in that time, I ended up becoming a visual merchandiser um, for Forever 21. So my um, time to work would be 10 p.m. to 5 or 6 in the morning. So again, I'm extremely fatigued. I'm not feeling well. I assumed it was my work schedule. Um, in that time, I ended up finding a fashion internship over in Milan, Italy, so I moved over to Italy. This is probably where my body starts doing some weird things that at the time I didn't think was as serious as, you know, what I know now. So I'm living in Italy and I start getting really sick. Um, you know, anything digestive, stomach aches, extreme bloating, um, just my body was essentially rejecting anything I would eat. So, um, I didn't really know what to do when I made it back over to the States. Um, my mom suggested I go to a doctor and, you know, look at food allergies and try to figure out what's going on. So, I go to a doctor. She runs everything, comes back and says, yeah, you have all these severe allergies to the most random things, to garlic, gluten, um, beef, eggs, dairy, cow's milk, mozzarella, chili powder, like whey protein, the most random things, but it was a pretty big list. And at this point, I'm 22. Um, I had lived my entire life basically on, you know, an Italian food diet, kind of. I mean, my mom's Sicilian, so I grew up with gluten and, you know, dairy and all kinds of things. Um, so it was really weird for me to understand, okay, at 22, my body has now decided it's going to reject all kinds of food that I've literally grown up eating. So at this point, okay, cool. Like, I don't think anything crazy is happening. I guess I'm just unlucky. So I then, you know, become gluten free and I avoid all these foods. And every restaurant I go to or wedding or party or whatever, I have to tell the waiter, um, hey, like, here's my list of allergies. You know, it's not debilitating, it's more annoying, I would say. Um, the only thing that has never stopped with that because I honestly, over the years, I have had those foods and nothing crazy happens. And anyone with a true food allergy could tell me if they have something they're severely aller allergic to, they get really sick. So nothing happens to me when I have those other than I get extremely bloated. Um, that has never stopped. I could literally eat like a kale salad and water and I'm going to be bloated like I'm like four months pregnant. Um, that has continued from 22 all the way to now. Um, so that's that. I'm back in the States. I'm now living with these food allergies. Okay, great. So at this point, um, I go back to Italy for my 23rd birthday. Um, which should be amazing, right? It's your 23rd birthday. You're in Italy for a month. Um, all I wanted to do the entire time was sleep. And I was so tired. I just wanted to lay in bed. And I remember thinking, like, is this, like, extreme jet lag? Like, what is going on? And at 23 years old, this should not be an issue. So, I remember the people I was with were just like, why are you so tired? Like, what is up with you? And I was just out of it. That was also the time where my balance started going. So I used to run around in like five, six inch heels, no problem. On this trip, it was like, I was just like wobbly and like off balance. And I contributed that to, I'm so tired. I don't know why. So I come back to the States again. My mom suggests I go back to a doctor. I'm thinking at this point, like, I have anemia or some kind of deficiency that's making me so sleepy. Nothing's wrong. And they're like, hey, maybe it's a side effect to your food allergies. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm not eating anything I'm allergic to. 
So that was kind of left off there. Um, I start working as a stylist and I'm still going to school. So at this point, I then develop a full body rash that basically was like um, little like white dots, like little spots everywhere. So it started like chest, neck, and it just spread. And I had that for about eight or nine months. Um, I went to dermatologists who could not figure it out. Um, at the end of it, they ended up putting me on steroids, um, topically and internally. And that got rid of it, but it was like an eight, nine month, you know, situation. And, um, that was difficult, obviously, because then you're, you know, I don't know why I'm so tired. I don't know where these allergies came from. I'm starting to become off balance. And now my body is covered in a rash for basically the better part of a year. And I'm trying to go to school and work and function. And I have no idea what's happening. So then my mom comes down to visit me and I was living downtown Orlando at the time and she was like, hey, I'm going to get you a bike. Like that'd be really fun for you to, you know, like get exercise, get out, ride a bike, whatever. You're downtown. Cool. She brings my, well, the bike she got for me and her bike. Long story short, <laughs> I cannot ride this bike. Like I... I'm shaking. I can't keep my balance. I mean, it was the craziest thing. And I grew up in Michigan, like playing sports, riding bikes, you know, sun up to sundown. So my mom was like, what is going on? And he got to the point where I literally like fell off my bike and like sliced my leg open. I mean, it was crazy. So that at that point we're in the end of 2012 um at that point i'm still not like okay something serious is happening i'm more just i guess trying to accept certain things and assuming all right like i'm approaching my mid-20s i don't know like maybe people just develop issues um so then once we get to 2013 is where I start going to doctors and specialists. Um, so basically one day um, I'm leaving my apartment and I'm going, I was on the second floor at the time, I'm going down some stairs and my brain was like, okay, like go down the stairs. I mean, it's a basic function. So you don't think about these things like running, walking, going downstairs, you know, balancing. These are not things you think about because our body is made to do them. So my brain is okay, go downstairs. My body will not do it. So at that point, <laughs> I'm just like, something is wrong. Something is really wrong. And I went to a doctor and the doctor, um, this was my second misdiagnosis over the years and she goes into this elaborate thing where I picked up a virus. It could be from, you know, going overseas, from um, just anywhere and it's attacking my inner ear and I need to go to an ENT, um, ear, nose, and throat specialist. So and then I'm referred to him. I go to him. They put me through all these tests, um, you know, all kinds of things. I'll list them below. Um, they tell me, okay, yep, you have disequilibrium. Now, <laughs> disequilibrium is not actually like a true disorder. It's saying there is something wrong. There's something going on with your equilibrium, which controls your balance, but it's not actually diagnosing it as a true condition. So essentially it was like, yep, something's wrong and here's what we're going to call it, but we don't know what it is. So 
he tells me, no worries. You know, we're going to give you a prescription for about a month. You'll be good to go. So I leave there ecstatic. Okay, this explains everything. I'm going to take this prescription for a month. It's going to go away. Uh, prescription number one was promethazine. Um, I was on it for a month. I was like a zombie. I literally couldn't get out of bed. It had me completely debilitated. I go back to him. Nothing changed. Nothing worked. I can't be on that. Okay, so prescription number two is a month of twice a day I'm taking Valium. So if you've ever tried Valium or, you know, those types of drugs, they have you like very loopy and just out of it. I'm on that twice a day for a month. I was calling out of work because I literally would just, it was like I was like floating. I couldn't even get my words together. I couldn't function. So I call back. I'm like, I can't be on these drugs. They're not even changing anything. So I go back to the ENT and they basically told me that day that whatever I have wrong with me is permanent and it's never going away and I'm going to live the rest of my life like this and it may or may not get worse over time. I <laughs> broke down naturally because at that point I'm 24, 25 and I'm being told that I'm now going to be debilitated for the rest of my life. And it may get worse. <sighs> then they tell me, okay, but there's one thing that could help. And I'm like, yes, what is it? I'll do it. Um, vestibular therapy. Um, so they tell me that if I do three months of vestibular therapy, three times a week for three months, and it's like after insurance kicks in, like $50 a session. So I was paying $150 every week for three months for this therapy for something that wasn't even going on with me. So I'm going to this therapy. There is no major difference. Um, I, in that time, changed my diet completely. Um, I think that was my first time going vegan. Um, I was doing everything I could think of to help this situation. Someone that danced my entire life, played sports, you know, super active, traveled, you know, and when you have to start living life where you can't enjoy life because you're debilitated, um, you become depressed. So this is where I have two new issues that I've never had, um, which are depression and anxiety. I become incredibly anxious because I don't like going in public anymore. I don't like going out in the open. I don't like being around new people because there's something wrong with me. And I don't even know what it is. So I start staying inside. Um, I stop meeting people. And my whole life I've been a very outgoing, social, you know, bubbly person until now. So this is still 2013. I'm 25 at this point. Um, so this is how my life is now. Um, at, now at this point, I'm a makeup artist at Mac and I'm still in school. So it gets to the point where I am having trouble being at work and standing on my feet and, you know, applying makeup to people and I can no longer do my job. So me, I try to be as proactive as I can and I'm like, all right, I have now graduated um, from college. I'm going to go ahead and look for a desk job. Probably the only good thing that happened to me at this point in my life, I did find a job six months later. Um, and I'm still there. I actually am fortunate and blessed enough to run my department. So in this whole experience, I would say my job has been the one thing I've kind of poured myself into. Um, 
you know, and relied on to keep me going because, you know, I have been depressed on and off for five years and I do have debilitating anxiety and I don't, you know, my quality of life is gone. So at this time, I find this job. Okay, so at this point, to my knowledge, the only thing wrong with me is I have some mysterious inner ear disorder that basically makes my day-to-day -day life um, really cloudy and fuzzy and you're just out of it. It's like extreme brain fog and you're just kind of going through the motions and I'm just constantly dizzy. So I go through my new job for about a year, just kind of living. Everything is slowly getting worse. So my balance is worse, anxiety is worse, depression is worse. It just is getting bad. So now we have to be, where are we, 2015-ish, somewhere in there. Um, I basically tell my mom, like, hey, something's wrong, and it's it's not my ears. And she's like, no, I, I agree. This can't be your ears. So then we go to another specialist. He's an infectious disease doctor, and I was referred to him because he finds very strange out there diseases that people have that are not well known. Go to him. He's intrigued by my symptoms because they're all over the place. And he's like, okay, we're gonna find out what's going on. He's thinking it's some like bizarre off the wall, it's gonna be some crazy like one in a million thing comes back after all my blood work. I don't know. I have no idea what's wrong with you. The only blood result I got that day from him was a positive ANA blood test. And I'm going to link all my results, everything below. Um, an ANA blood test, and don't quote me, this is literally from my knowledge, you know, um, it shows a autoimmune presence in your blood. So this test, again, to what I know about it, it shows, it can show, you know, lupus, um, signs of having an autoimmune disorder. So that was the one finding that we were like, okay, well, this has to mean there's something bigger. Okay, so at this point, we... At the time, I had a really good friend who is a doctor, and I was letting him know, and he was watching what was happening to me, and he, you know, recommended I go to another doctor who's extremely well-known, and um, she is still one of my primary care doctors today, but I go to her with all my binder of <laughs> results and tests and everything I've tried, and my positive ANA blood result. I go to her, I tell her my story, here's everything. She's of the opinion opinion at this point that I have lupus or MS, or possibly Lyme disease. These are the three things that for her were, okay, whatever's happening to you is autoimmune. And she basically sent me to a neurologist, um, an ENT, and um, one other specialist, I'll link it below. And we ran a series of tests, um, CAT scan, MRI, I did a nerve conduction test where they push needles, huge needles into your muscles. It's extremely uncomfortable. And I went through weeks and weeks of testing. My mom came and stayed with me for a couple months and I'm terrified. At this point, it's 2016. Um, I am scared out of my mind. I <laughs> am thinking the worst <sighs> because I know, I know what my body was doing for all these years. And 
So we do all this has everything normal. There's nothing. I go back to my doctor, hoping she has some other idea. She says to me, we're going to get you some names of some psychologists and psychiatrists. And I think you need to talk to someone um, because your symptoms, I think, are psychosomatic. So that's a really nice way of telling someone they're fucking crazy and that everything happening is in their head. Again, I leave another doctor, get in my car, and break down. <laughs> Which, if anyone's been in that position of being really sick and having things happen and nobody can give you an answer and the best answer they come up with is go see a shrink, um, there is nothing more insulting and upsetting. I decide, okay, you know, I'm going to... I'm going to fight this. Like, whatever's happening to my body, I have to have the power to change it. So I lost 40 pounds. I started counting my macros and macronutrients, and I can do a whole other thing about that. I was in the gym five, six days a week. I was at my optimum level of strength and health and in a way, I was feeling a bit better, but I was still extremely tired, fatigued, moody, depressed, agitated, um, and I still had this constant brain fog where like, you're kind of dragging yourself like through life and you're not a part of life, you know, and <laughs> by now, I'm no longer the fun friend or the fun girlfriend or the fun family member. I'm you know, the girl with tons of problems that, you know, at least to me, um, I felt like a burden to everyone in my life. Um, so I get to my complete healthiest point and I'm still just not feeling right. And at that point, I had been as proactive as I could be. You know, I... Uh, was excelling at work. I lost all this weight. I'm in the gym. I'm, you know, eating very clean, very healthy. I'm doing everything I possibly can. Um, and over the years, I tried everything. I was vegan. I was vegetarian. I did macros. I lost weight. I gained weight. I went to the gym. I didn't go to the gym. I tried supplements. I tried no supplements, prescriptions, no prescriptions, anti-anxiety medication, no medication, birth control, no birth control, and anything you can think of, I tried it. I tried freaking herbal teas. I tried no tea, coffee, no coffee, being hydrated, being dehydrated. Like, I tried the most random things to try to fix whatever was happening. And at this point, I went back to my doctor. They put me on a round of um, B12 shots because my blood was showing extreme deficiencies in B vitamins and vitamin D um, and iron and, you know, certain things that are common in women and certain things that were to a crazy kind of low. So I did B12 shots. There was no crazy improvement. Um... And basically every doctor I saw was just like, if you get worse, let us know. Um, you may want to consider, you know, getting a job at home, you know, and basically confining myself to my home <laughs> and living this life. Um, I never gave up. I would stay up every night researching <sighs> and it was... <laughs> It was almost weekly that I would call my mom. Like, oh my god, I think I know what I have. It's it's this, it's that. And I would find the most random things that I could think maybe is something I had. Um, and it never was. So and, um, I had my first set of implants for nine years. Um, I thought, at this point, I still don't know anything about breast implant illness. I always heard every 10 to 15 years you should get them replaced. So 
I made an appointment with a plastic surgeon here in Florida. Um, went to see him. Hey, do you think I should have these replaced? He's, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And let's switch you over to silicone. Um, you're going to love it. It's like the gummy bear technology. Everyone loves it. Okay, cool. You know, I he's the expert. He does it every day. I, I trusted him. Um, when I got that surgery, it was January 2018. So I have not even had the silicone implants for a year. Um, they will come out this November. Um, so it's not even a year. And that surgery, I think people in my life could agree, I've never recovered from. Um, they are 575 cc's, which that is not even the size I agreed to. Um, I agreed to 500 cc's because I was told this silicone is more dense and I would need to go from the 425 with the saline a little bigger to kind of fill everything. Um, somehow I ended up with 575 cc's. Um, I don't know what happened. It was never explained to me why that was changed. Basically, I wake up um, out of surgery and I can't breathe and I have chest pain. And I've already had this surgery once before and it was not like that. So something's wrong. I get home. Um, I'm throwing up, which is common after general anesthesia, but this was different. This was, it was like my body was trying to get something out. Um, I couldn't walk. I couldn't breathe. My chest hurt. I'm on oxys and I'm still in pain. I am crying. It was just, it was like horrific. And I've had the surgery before. So I... <laughs> The crazy thing is most people say your second augmentation is way easier because there's no, uh, they say it's easier because there's no like stretching or anything like that. They're just taking one out, putting one in. Um, I ended up in the ER. They did a chest x-ray, CAT scan, blood work. Um, I was there for six, seven hours. Um, they come in, okay, nothing's wrong, you're good to go. And I'm sitting there and I'm having chest pain and I can't breathe and I can't walk and what the fuck do you mean I'm good to go? <laughs> so I leave there again, leaving another doctor just like, what the fuck? So it was like I never recovered. I never gained control of my body back. I have struggled walking every day since. Um, the new symptoms that came on with the silicone, neck pain, shoulder pain, back pain, body pain, chronic body pain that will wake you up out of a dead sleep. Um, the those I would say are like the brand new. I did not feel that with the other set. The brain fog is more extreme. The dizziness is more extreme. Um, everything is like amplified now. Um, it's to the point where I get through my work week and my weekends are literally spent inside and I only go out in public if it's like a major special event that my friends and people I trust that know what's been going on, if they'll be there. Um, other than that, I don't go out. Um, part of it, I'm embarrassed um, and my anxiety will kick in. The other part, I'm too tired, I'm exhausted. Weight gain, you're just like inflamed. And I did lose weight during this when I was very extreme in the gym five, six days a week. I was doing the macro dieting. Um, I did lose 40 pounds. Um, other than that, <laughs> you know, I put everything back on. I That 40 pounds is now back on. Um, and even when I went to see my doctor who's removing them, you know, they said to me, I'm looking at you and you're inflamed. Um, you can see it. So, um, people that know me, uh, definitely don't know this version of me. Um, it's 
been um, completely life ruining <laughs> and I've lost my 20s and I will never get them back and that's not to say like of course there were good times in there and I have good memories and I've tried to make the best of it but at the end of the day you know <laughs> this has just been horrible and you know, I get asked a lot now, would I go back and do I have regrets? Yes, I do. Um, now that this has happened and this was the price I paid, I mean, of course I regret it. I would be crazy not to. I didn't know. And if I knew, I wouldn't have made the same choices. Um, and this brings me to something that's a way bigger topic, but just to touch on it. Um, you know, we live our lives relying on certain, you know, laws and regulations and things to be put in place. You assume if something is done every day, you know, I think it's like 300,000 implants are done in the U.S. per year. And they're FDA approved and, you know, all these people out there have them. And, you know, these things aren't said or discussed or known. You don't think um, you're going to put yourself in danger or at risk. And now that this has kind of come out, I've done some, you know, research on everything. Uh, silicone going in the chest cavity was not even legal until 2006. Um, <laughs> also, silicone is not approved to go in your face, but it can go in your chest cavity millimeters from your lungs and your heart and vital organs. That makes no fucking sense at all to anyone. These are not things they share with you. And this is not just implants. This goes so far into birth control, IUD, you know, replacements in the body, hip replacements. There are things that are destroying people's lives that the FDA has clear evidence on. They hide it and they get around approvals to get things through. And this is something that needs to be openly talked about because it will never come from them and it will never come from a physician or an expert or anyone that is in it for their own reasons. But it's gonna come from the people whose lives that it's destroyed. It's definitely hard for me to kind of put this out there. You know, I'm talking about my body and, um, you know, basically explaining what's happened over eight years. And, but again, I wouldn't have known if I didn't see Carissa's video. And that's a fact. I did not figure this out from a doctor or a specialist or a physician, I found this out from another person that put their story out there. So for me, it's, there is an obligation. Um, so I hope anyone that has them, I hope this never happens to you. If you start feeling these symptoms, and I'm gonna show the 40 symptoms that are associated with this, look into it and just be aware. If you're thinking about getting implants, I would tell you not to. I would tell you that if you're maybe younger, life changes, you change. You don't need this. And <laughs> you don't need to prove yourself to anyone. It makes you no more attractive, no more special than what you already are. Um... You know, and there are so many reasons people do this. And if it's something that you really have your heart set on, then I guess, you know, just be aware of what to watch for and be aware of what you would have to do to undo it. Um, I'm going to live the rest of my life with scars all over my chest and a loss of eight years of my life because of a decision I made when I was 19. Um, when I thought certain things mattered that really don't. So, um, you know, do I understand like how it feels and why people get them and 
why they would make that choice. Of course I do. I've made that choice not once, twice. Um, I don't judge anyone for it. I just, now that I know what I know and I've lived it, I would advise against it. Um, or at least if you're thinking of any kind of like body altering, you know, foreign body going in your body, do your homework, you know, dig deep before you make that kind of choice. Okay, so now we're at the point of how I found out about breast implant illness and kind of how I realized I have it. Um, so at this point, it's clear I've exhausted every medical option out there, every test, every blood test, there's nothing. Um, so one day I'm getting ready for work and I see this girl I follow on YouTube post a video um, her name's Carissa Puka, so I'll list her below. Um, and it said, my breast implants made me sick. And I remember not thinking like, oh my god, that's it. But thinking, I have implants, I have to watch that too. Um, to see, you know, what she's talking about. Um, I didn't have time that day, so it was several days later. Put it on. <sighs> Within one minute of her talking, I stopped everything I was doing and I'm just staring down at my phone. Um, so, <laughs> eight years in the making, um, I knew without a doubt, without any doubt in this world, that's what's wrong with me. I knew it from what she was saying, from um, what she was saying, how upset she was in her videos, and it was like watching myself explain what I had been feeling like, um, and I knew it, so I called my mom and my friends and my coworkers, and they're looking at it like, oh my god, this is it. Um, I joined Nicole's Healing um, for Bre Breast Implant Illness support group online, which now has about 54,000 women on there. This is becoming a huge thing, and I just think any person that's a part of it affected by it, know someone affected by it, you have a responsibility to share it because that is how this is getting out there. So after my second surgery with the uh, silicone implants, I did go back to the plastic surgeon who did this and I went back um, after I had seen Chris's video and I was on this kind of <laughs> journey to figure out everything I could figure out about breast implant illness. So I went back to him to let them know, hey, like, I'm not doing so well. I never recovered from surgery and hear all these things happening. Um, I get there. I go in the room with him and a nurse. And it was, like, creepy. Like, they were, they knew why I was coming in. And they were like a united front to basically tell me that's not real, people don't get sick, you know, that doesn't happen. It has to be something else. Um, he basically tells me two things. One, you probably have some rare autoimmune disease that's not even in the books. What the fuck does that actually mean? What do you, like, I, you're, what? I have some rare disease that's not even in the books. Like, okay. Second thing he tells me is you will look awful without your implants and you will hate what you see. Completely missing the point that I don't actually give a shit because I've lost my life. I've lost my happiness. So it was weird. I was there for like, 15 minutes where him and his nurse who <laughs> honestly were like scary they were just standing there and I'm sitting there just looking for some answers and some help and I basically was told you probably have some disease no one's ever heard of 
and you're going to look like shit without your implants. Have a good one. Um, and he told me the only way he would take them out or do anything to help me is if one ruptured. So I could go and get an MRI. Um, and if one ruptured, he would take them out and replace them. That's like, <laughs> so that was that experience. Um, I left there just feeling like shit because I was so sure I had found the answer um, to what was wrong with me. And I expected a doctor to be more understanding of like, wow, okay, like this girl's not doing so well. And he could physically see it. You know, I, I can't balance. I have trouble walking. You know, I'm fatigued. I can't breathe. Like you can see that. And to still send me on my way, just letting me know I'm going to look like shit if I get them out. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was really upsetting. So it was like a few weeks later, I went to, um, down to Jupiter, Florida to see Dr. Rankin. And finally I was at another plastic surgeon's office who actually wanted to help me and they believed me. Um, and now, honestly, more of their business is explanting. I mean, it's crazy. It's people are explanting daily at this point. Um, so, you know, um, and I'm not gonna sit here and like talk about who my other doctors are or bash them or attack their profession. I'm not doing that. Um, I'm just simply saying. You have to be your own advocate for your health because no one else is going to do it for you. And if a doctor is telling you something, get another opinion. Get 10 other opinions. Do your own research because you know what your body is doing. I made the mistake for years of trusting that these doctors have my best interests at heart. You know, and at the end of the day, I ended up getting tossed out and told I was crazy. People, you know, have asked me how I knew I was sick. Um, that really wasn't hard to know. I My body essentially feels like it's shutting down and that it has been for a long time. Um, I feel like I'm like 100 years old. Like I have joint pain, body aches. Um, I mean, it's incredible. My neck hurts, my shoulders hurt, my back hurts. I get headaches, um, blurry vision. I randomly will like burst into like sweating and then I'll be freezing cold and shaking. Um, my body can't regulate temperature and has become extremely sensitive to feeling temperature. Um, I'm dizzy, I'm disoriented, I'm off balance. Um, my walking is almost impossible now. I can't breathe. I have heart palpitations, um, chest pain, um, brain fog to the extreme. My motor skills have started going over time. So everything from writing, um, I drop things like, you know, trying to like lock my door. I'll drop my keys or, you know, it's like a challenge to do the weirdest things. Um, my coordination is off. Um, you know, I wake up with extreme body pain and I have an enlarged thyroid. Um, no actual thyroid problem, but it's enlarged. Um, my doctor came in the room and was like, hey, I can see your thyroid. It's enlarged. Um... I have been diagnosed with disequilibrium, which basically says my inner ear is inflamed. Um, so there's inflammation on my entire body, um, weight gain, chronic fatigue, um, appetite changes, bloating, throwing up, digestive issues, um, food intolerance. I mean, I'm going to list them all, but I have like 30 of the 40 symptoms. Um... So that's how I knew I was sick. I mean, there's no other way. Like how I kind of explained, I mean, it starts, for me, it started slow. And, you know, then I was like, wow, something's wrong. And um, so I would say I've had symptoms for eight years. I've had extreme symptoms that have changed my life for about five. 
Um, so 25 to 30 years old, that whole time has been a struggle. Um, so that's kind of like day-to-day -day life. And then I mean, as a result of these symptoms, you become depressed and you become anxious. Like I said, I'm going to make a part two and a part three. So, and I may make other videos as I, you know, recover and detox. Um, where I go from here, um, it's going to be this Monday, so November 5th, that I will explant. Um, I have no idea what the recovery is going to be like because some women say it was really easy, some have a hard time. Um, I'm going to make a video of surgery day. Um, I actually have someone filming the actual surgery, so I am going to put that in here, um, <laughs> or in part two. Um, so you can see that, um, the recovery, you know, all of that. So that one will be the actual explant. And then part three will be some weeks after um, detoxing and just talking about what symptoms immediately were gone for me and which ones I'm still going to work on. So it was a very long road getting this sick. And I'm aware that it's probably going to be a long road recovering. Um, but I'm trying to be really positive and optimistic about it. Um, I'm scared, so I'm not going to lie and be like, you know, I'm so strong and I'm so ready. Um, I'm terrified right now. Um, I, <laughs> like any woman, you know, I'm scared of the outcome. <sighs> I'm scared of what's going to be left. Um, you know, I'm scared of all of that, but... There is nothing more important than your health. I'm planning on changing my diet, my exercise, um, makeup I use, uh, products I use, everything. Everything in my life will be changing. Um, it's really important that you become very clean, very chemical free. Um, I do not plan on drinking any alcohol for about a year, um, sugar, dairy, you know, processed foods out the door. It's not happening. So yeah, um, I just, you know, um, if you guys have any information or, you know, any stories or if you think you might have this, please, you know, comment below. Um, I'm extremely opening, open to talking about it. Um, so thanks for watching. And, um, I guess I will see you guys in part two of the actual surgery.